little bit about Hillsong. Some of you guys are maybe wondering my thoughts on this particular issue. If you're not aware, uh, Discovery Plus has just announced that they're coming out with a documentary series. I believe it's going to be a three-part series called Hillsong, a Mega Church Exposed. Hillsong, a Mega Church Exposed. Basically, some of the things that have been coming out lately have to do with moral failures, egregious, uh, publicly now known sins uh, in high up leadership positions of Hillsong. Uh, most notably would be Brian Houston, the founder of Hillsong in Australia, and Carl Lentz, who has been the uh, iconic Hillsong pastor, and I have to put pastor in quotations marks, um, pastor in New York City. And these guys have had um, a lot of notoriety. Carl Lentz has uh, had connections with Justin Bieber and uh, Chris Pratt has uh, been publicly known to associate with Hillsong and other individuals in the public sphere, other uh, celebrities. And, and so what we see in the case of Brian Houston is allegedly uh, he has had inappropriate relationships uh, with at least two women. Also, one of the big um, alleged scandals is that he has covered up um, sexual abuse of his father with children. And in the case of Carl Lentz, there is uh, an affair that we have heard about uh, from a particular woman that I believe was something that was ongoing for about uh, five months. He has already been uh, removed. That happened previously. And now Brian Houston has resigned from his position. And so all these things are falling apart with Hillsong. The documentary is going to come out and it promises to be filled with all kinds of juicy details. And uh, I'm not saying that Christians shouldn't watch it. I do want to warn Christians um, that they should be careful because uh, Discovery Plus is not Christian itself. And so uh, basically you're going to have this quasi-Christian group. It's not really a true Christian church, and I'll explain why Hillsong is not a true Christian church. But this quasi, you know, alleged Christian group, pseudo-Christian group, being um, basically being judged by, dissected and scrutinized by pagans, you know, by, by pagans. In some sense, uh, very similar to the rise and fall of Mars Hill, uh, which was a podcast uh, series that was uh, done by Christian Christianity Today. Now, the difference, I would say, is that Mars Hill, despite Mark Driscoll's failures and the church's failures, uh, Mark Driscoll would certainly be more in line with biblical orthodoxy and his theology uh, than Hillsong, Brian Houston, and Carl Lentz. Um, so you can hate Mark Driscoll all you want, uh, but you have to put him in a better, more positive category than uh, Hillsong. Um, and uh, in terms of Christianity Today, however, if you're saying Discovery Plus, you know, in Christianity Today, well, I, I do think that the rise and fall of Mars Hill was... Um, was ultimately uh, a judgment rendered by pagans. Um, and you might be saying, well, Christianity Today isn't Discovery Plus. Christianity Today is Christians. Uh, no, I'm, I'm going to stick with pagans. Um, you're talking about egalitarian, radical, feminist, um, driven by the fear of man, the approval of man, uh, buying into every cultural, popular idea in our day, uh, demonizing Christian nationalism, but using that phrase as a boogeyman that doesn't actually mean anything. Um, so if you listened, I did just for research purposes, not for personal edification, but research purposes so that I could speak to it. If you listen to the rise and fall of Mars Hill, uh, you ba basically have uh, Mark Driscoll being accused of uh, toxic masculinity, uh, his, his harmful and destructive views of men and women. And there are certain things he did that I think were out of line, that I actually do think were immoral in that regard. Um, but I don't think that this judgment needs to be rendered by Christianity Today, which is a bunch of feminist egalitarians. Um, it's kind of the pot calling the kettle black. You have one group on this side of the polar equation that is clearly unbiblical and unfaithful, uh, criticizing and making judgments of somebody on the other end of the spectrum. But all that being said, as it comes to Hillsong, as it regards Hillsong, Brian Houston, Carl Lentz, you know, the big, the big thing is scandals, uh, sexual immorality, affairs, um, egregious moral failures, these kinds of things. But uh, what I want Christians to see is that this is the first of May. We have seen this before, and we will see it again. There is nothing new under the sun. We have seen mega church conglomerates, brands, corporate brands in the church world 
fall. We have seen the fall of empires, church empires before, and we will see them again. And I believe that we're going to see um, we're going to see more than we've seen in the past. I think that it's going to begin to snowball, and uh, we're going to see a lot of failure, um, a lot of, of mega church um, structures imploding. Um, for one, I think just the ecclesiology, right, that has to do with doctrine of the church, what the Bible says the church is and its function and its role and responsibility, its purpose. Um, ecclesiology in America is atrocious, atrocious. So this idea of multiple campuses building an empire, why, why don't you just plant churches? Well, you can't plant churches because you want it all to fall underneath one name, one brand, right? You're trying to build this brand. So instead of actually having um, an autonomous church that is led by a plurality of elders, it's an independent autonomous church with its own congregation and church membership and all these things. Instead of that, you, you expand the brand, you expand the empire. It's all connected to the mothership, uh, its campuses rather than individual churches. Um, there are massive problems with this, but there's a deeper problem than even that. There is a deeper problem uh, underlining Hillsong. And my point is I think there is a common denominator that is entirely, completely unbiblical uh, that is not unique to Hillsong. It underlies this common denominator. Um, many, and I might even say most, churches in America, most churches in in America. And so to illustrate this point, what I want to do is um, I, I could just kind of go off script and say it, but I, I've, I've actually written on this subject. And so for the purpose of being clear and concise, I want to read what I've already written. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, this is a book uh, that I wrote a while back. It's called Am I Truly Saved? The book deals with the assurance of salvation. Uh, a lot of you guys probably don't know this about my own personal testimony, but um, I I wrestled with the question of whether or not I was truly born again, whether or not I was actually saved by God for several years. And I even wrestled with that in the early days of being a church planter. So here I am, a pastor, biting off more than I uh, could chew, by the way. I, I, if you've heard my testimony, I think I planted a church before I should have, before I was really ready. Uh, God was merciful in that, but the ends don't justify the means, right? In God's sovereign will, and his perfect will, he uses all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Um, but all that means is that God was merciful. It doesn't mean that Joel was wise. I would say Joel was foolish um, in terms of my timing, biting off more than I could chew, embarking on church planting before I was ready. And the only reason it worked out, and I, by God's grace, I was able to baptize over 100 people, and the church that I left behind in California is still going and healthy. Uh, the only reason why those things worked out was not because I was wise, but because God was merciful. Um, and the, the ends, the fact that God used it for good and for his glory, does not justify uh, the means, right? The ends don't justify the means, right? God, the end of, of Jesus and his crucifixion was the salvation of, of the world, right? That, that God is saving people from every tribe, tongue, and nation by the atoning work, the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Uh, that's the end, but the means was that Jesus was wrongfully tried. He had a mock trial in the middle of the night. They produced false witnesses whose testimonies didn't even align with one another. Um, and they crucified the Son of Glory. They put to death an innocent man. This is murder. So it was false witness, bearing false witness, a, a breach of the ninth commandment. It was murder because Jesus was innocent, right? That's a breach of the sixth commandment, thou shalt not murder. And, uh, and all of that was uh, formed with envy and jealousy, this coveting, the Pharisees, they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Jesus himself said that. And they saw that the crowds uh, were enamored with Jesus, and they were jealous of these things. So that's a breach of the tenth commandment: um, "Thou shall not uh, covet." And and Jesus, one of the things that he was doing in his earthly ministry was systematically through his teaching dismantling the Pharisees' um, their embezzlement of of funds, how they would manipulate and contrive the poorest of the poor to give everything they had to the temple, so that the Pharisees. Could, could financially benefit from that. So they were stealing, right? That would be the eighth commandment. Thou shalt not 
steal. We could even argue that the Pharisees, their hearts were, were ultimately about the fear of man rather than the fear of God. They wanted man's approval rather than God's approval. So they were spiritually adulterous. That's a breach of the seventh commandment. Um, thou shalt not commit adultery. So uh, my point is uh, Jesus' crucifixion, Jesus' crucifixion was accomplished through sin. Lots of sin, lots of sinners, lots of people sinning and committing not just one, but multiple sins, multiple breachings, uh, multiple transgressions against multiple commandments that God gave uh, to humanity. And so, um, so the, the end that God used, the life and death, wrongful murder of Jesus to bring about salvation and reconciliation for the people of God, those who he elected before the foundations of the world, the fact that God had a good end in mind that he uses for, uh, for holy, good, righteous purposes does not justify the means. And what I mean by that is that the Pharisees uh, can't stand before the throne of God and say, hey, we're not guilty of doing anything wrong because look at how it all turned out. Look at how it all turned out, right? So all that being said, my point is, I wrestled with the assurance of salvation. I bit off more than I could chew. I got into church planting uh, before I was ready. God used it for good. God did incredible things in his sovereign will, in his perfect will. Um, so what does that mean? Uh, the fact that it worked out, it means I'm off the hook. I'm not morally, cul uh, morally culpable, right? No, it doesn't mean that. It means God is merciful. It doesn't mean Joel is wise. It means God is merciful. And, and part of me embarking in church planting before I was ready, um, these kinds of things caused me to struggle with the assurance of salvation for a very long time. And so this book, Am I Truly Saved, is uh, basically, uh, I, I preached through 1 John, uh, John's first epistle in the New Testament, and I took all my sermon notes and I reworked them and reworked them and turned it into a personal study. So this book, it kind of is, is really just a Bible study through 1 John, going text by text, verse by verse, and drawing out the major themes. And one of the, the predominant themes in John's first epistle is the assurance of salvation, right? And the gospel of John, he says, I write these things so that you might believe in the one who was sent, and Jesus, the only Son of God. So the purpose of the Gospel of John is that people might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Son of God, the Savior of the world. So the Gospel of John, his, his, one of his big purposes, John, inspired by the Holy Spirit, writing the Gospel of John, is that people might believe. But in 1 John, the Apostle John says, I write these things so that you might know that you believe. And listen, listen to this. You, you need to understand, Christian, there's a difference between believing and knowing that you believe, right? So the Gospel of John, I write these things so that you might believe. And First John, I write these things so that you might know that you believe. See, I believed, I, I truly believe now, looking back in retrospect, that I was born again by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, that God saved me, objectively saved me. I was converted in a real moment in time, but, but I was believing and saved long before I knew that I believed. And so I wrote this whole book on the assurance of salvation, but in it, I talk about one of the reasons why people struggle with the assurance of salvation is they don't understand the church and what it's supposed to be, and, and they have been a part of, they've been indoctrinated and brainwashed in many ways by seeker-sensitive churches, seeker-friendly churches. I think seeker-friendly churches um, are, are the devil's, handiwork. Seeker-sensitive churches are the devil's handiwork. So Brian Houston and Carl Lentz, egregious moral failures, adultery, all these kinds of things, is that a big deal? Yes and amen. That is a big deal. But if they had never cheated on their wives, if they had never tried to cover up sexual immorality with other leaders in the church, if they had never tried to cover up sexual abuse, allegedly with Brian Houston's father, these kinds of things, if none of those egregious moral failures had ever occurred, Hillsong would still be terribly poisonous to your soul. Hillsong would still be terribly dangerous, dangerous for any person, leading them ultimately to hell, not to heaven, but to hell because of their seeker-sensitive methods, which are theologically in direct contrast, in direct contradiction to what the Word of God says. So without further ado, let me read you an excerpt from this book, uh, 
for those of you who are just now tuning in, people are coming on, we're doing live. Uh, the book is Am I Truly Saved? It's a study through 1 John. It's forwarded by Costi Hinn. Some of you guys are familiar with Costi, Benny Hinn's nephew, who came out of the prosperity gospel movement, out of that seeker-friendly, um, um, man-made, pagan methodology, trying to get people to become converts. So Costi Hinn is a faithful gospel minister. God saved him from all that garbage. Uh, he wrote the forward for this. Also, I've got people who endorsed it, one of them being Justin Peters. Some of you guys are familiar with Justin Peters. We've had him on our show before uh, with Right Response Ministries. Justin is a friend of mine. Uh, he's done a lot of work exposing false teachers, exposing the prosperity gospel, and so he also endorsed this book. So if you're wondering, uh, can I trust this book? You know, Joel, maybe I'm new to you and your ministry. Um, how do I know if it's credible? Well, if you are familiar with Kossi Hinn or Justin Peters, if you deem these men as credible, then um, they've given... Um, their endorsement to this book. Costi wrote the forward, Justin Peters has endorsed it. All right, so this is lesson two. So it's very early on in the book. Lesson two, it's very short. I'll read it to you now. Um, it's titled, Real Christianity Always Starts with God. That's key. Real Christianity, actual biblical Christianity, the type of Christianity that actually saves, not, uh, not man's gospel, but the gospel of God, which is the only, the exclusive power of God for salvation, for all people, first for the Jew, then for the Greek, right? The only hope of salvation is the gospel. But the question is, whose gospel? It's not man's gospel, it's God's gospel. And guess what? God's gospel, which is a story, it's a, it's a, it's a proclamation, it is a testimony of the life and the death and the resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ, his person, that he is truly God and truly man, and his finished work, his atonement, his sinless life, his, his, um, his uh, death as a propitiation put forward by God to atone for the sins of people, his resurrection, which is not just an ethereal triumph of the human spirit, but a, but a bodily resurrection of the first fruits of what we who are in Christ by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, what we can expect that we one day will be bodily raised from the dead and his ascension, which speaks to his glory and his authority, his power that he ascended to heaven and is seated now at the right hand of the Father, ruling and reigning. This gospel, this testimony, this proclamation of who Jesus is, the whole message, the whole gospel of God, which is the only gospel, there are a lot of gospels out there, but there's only one that is God's gospel. And that's the only gospel that has the power of God for salvation for all kinds of people, first for the Jew and first for the Greek, uh, and second for the Greek, this gospel, God's gospel, the saving gospel, one of the things that is unique about it, one of the distinctions of God's gospel is that it starts with God. It starts with God. Man's gospel always, this is one of the ways you can detect false gospels and false teaching and false teachers and false churches and false ministries. One of the ways that you can discern between what is false and what is true is that the message of God's gospel, true biblical Christianity, begins with God, everything else. All other false religions, they all begin with man. All right, so this is 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. Just one verse, but it is profound. 1 John 1, verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. See, we live in an age, reading now, we live in an age when the good news of God's grace has been stripped of its power. The good news loses its meaning when the bad news is never adequately conveyed. If someone discovered the secret for curing all forms of cancer, for instance, this announcement would be undoubtedly received as good news by all. Everyone would be excited about this announcement. But which individuals among us would celebrate the most? Would it not be those who were previously diagnosed with cancer? People who actually have cancer? See, if a person discovers that Christ has died for their sin without first being made profoundly aware that they are in fact a sinner and that the wages for sin is death, they will never fully appreciate the beauty of what God has mercifully accomplished through the work of his son, Jesus Christ. Put another way, Charles Spurgeon would regularly say, a person cannot appreciate the beauty of Christ, that Christ is lovely, they cannot appreciate the beauty of Christ unless they first come to see the need for Christ. 
right? You can't appreciate the loveliness of Christ unless you first come to be convinced of the necessity for Christ. And we become convinced of our need for a Savior by hearing the bad news. The bad news that God is thrice holy, 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 and that he has a holy law, and that all of us are sinners by nature and by choice, and that we have transgressed his law, and the wages of sin is eternal death. That's the bad news. Now, God being holy is not bad news. That's good news. But the bad news is that we are not holy, that we are sinners, and that we have transgressed the holy law of a thrice holy God, and therefore the only just consequence for our transgression, for our cosmic betrayal of the holy God is hell eternal death. And here's the problem. Because God is holy, he by no means, as the scripture says, he by no means pardons the guilty. God, a holy God, cannot pardon the guilty without compromising his justice. He can't, right? God can't just turn a blind eye to sin. God can't just overlook sin. God cannot just simply lower his standards for righteousness. God cannot adopt moral mediocrity. God can't lower the bar. God can't ignore the guilty. God is just. So, so if, if a holy God pardons those who are not holy, those who have transgressed his holiness, then, then God's holiness would be compromised. God's own holiness would be compromised if he, if he pardoned those who are not holy. Unless, for God to be holy and uphold his perfect justice while dealing mercifully with those who are not holy, sinners, in order for God to do all these things, atonement, actual payment, must be made. That's the foundation. That's the framework for the gospel. So for a person to hear the gospel of God, which is the only power of salvation for all kinds of people, first for the Jew and then for the Greek, for a person to hear the gospel of God as really good news, they first have to hear the bad news, which is that they are a sinner in need of Christ. All right, here's the next portion. The proper starting place. Faithful biblical ministries and a faithful biblical gospel presentation has to have the proper starting place. Here we go. Verse five of our text, 1 John chapter one, verse five, it begins by saying, this is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. We must take note of at least two critical points in this verse. First, John does not, is not merely voicing his personal opinion of what he thinks God might be like. Instead, John says, this is the message that we have heard from him being Jesus. So John, that's the first thing we got to get. John's not saying, this is my message. And I think there's some really profound, wise nuggets in here. And you'd, you would do well to follow my advice. No, no, no. John says, this is not my message. It's a message of someone else that I've heard. And who is the someone else? Jesus, the Lord of glory, the eternal second member of the Trinity, the Son of of God. It's his message. It's not mine, right? So the first thing we need to know is John is not merely voicing his personal opinion of what he thinks God might be like. I think God's like this, right? I, I like to imagine that God is like this. Or God is like that, right? Did you ever <laughs> read the shack? If you haven't, don't. But if you ever read the shack, it's, it's just a person's opinion, right? It's not biblical. It's a person's opinion, and it directly contradicts what the Bible says. It's a person speculating about the nature of God. Well, I think God the Father is actually a mother. No. I think God the Holy Spirit is also a woman. No. And I think Jesus is kind of like this. No. It doesn't matter what you think. I don't care what you think. More importantly, God does not care what you think. Christian doctrine, biblical doctrine, sound doctrine, the gospel of God is not contingent upon the feelings and opinions of man. It's God's gospel. So this is the message, not our message, but this is God's message that we have heard from the Son of God himself, Jesus, and now proclaim to you. That's the first part that we got to get down, that we see in 1 John. Therefore, we must receive what John is about to say about the nature and character of God as an authoritative pronouncement from Christ himself through the testimony of his chosen 
apostles. Second, all right, so that's the first thing. Here's the second thing that we need to, to know. John does not begin with us. So first, John says, it's not my message, it's God's. So listen up. It bears authority. Not mere speculation, but it is an objective reality from God himself. It's God's message. That's number one. Number two, okay, what is getting into the contents of the message now? In this message, it does not begin with us. It does not begin with man. Instead, John begins with God by immediately bringing us face to face with a revelation, not of the love of God, but the perfect holiness of God. John plainly states, God is light, not love. Now, here's what's ironic. 1 John is, in fact, the book of the Bible that later on in this letter, this epistle, John actually does say God is love. That's one of the most famous Bible verses. A bunch of pagans and unbelievers even have memorized that verse, right? That God is love. And people make this argument, right? So talking about theology of proper. Theology proper within systematic theology is the doctrine of God. Theology proper is our doctrine of God, um, the nature of God. Who is God? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All right, so within theology proper, there, there's some bad doctrines circulating about God. Um, and one of them goes something like this. It's a bad hermeneutic, a bad way of interpreting the scripture. They'll say, well, you know, God, God possesses certain attributes, certain characteristics. There are certain attributes that God has, but there's only one attribute that God is. The Bible says God is love. So God, yeah, God has righteousness. God has justice. God has this. God has that. But God is love. And we see that in the scripture. We see in 1 John, God is love. Well, first, in the beginning of the letter, and this is intentional, inspired by the Holy Spirit. It's not a coincidence. John, in, 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 in proclaiming the message of God, not his message, but God's message, this message begins not with man, but with God himself. And what portion of God does John begin with? God is light. Not God is love. God is light. Now, Going back to God being love, John eventually gets there. He eventually gets there that God is love. However, this idea that God possesses certain attributes, but he is love, well, let's think about that for a moment. Doesn't the Bible say that God is, not just has, but is holy, holy, holy? You see the problem? With that faulty hermeneutic, well, God has justice, God has righteousness, but God is love. And therefore, what are they implicitly saying? They're saying that love trumps all these other things. And then <laughs> what they subconsciously do is they then define love rather than letting the Bible define what love actually is. That's a bad hermeneutic for, for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because all that is in God is God. God is justice. He doesn't just have justice, he is justice. And God is righteousness. Um, Secondly, though, even by adopting their faulty premise in this bad doctrine of God, bad theology proper, that God has certain attributes, but God is ontologically love, well, the scripture uses that same word wording um, in regards to God's holiness. God is love, when the Bible also says God is holy. And, just to play the devil's advocate for a moment, um, if we're going to adopt that faulty hermeneutic, God is love, well, the Bible says God is holy, holy, holy. So the Bible only says God is love once, but it says God is holy, 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 thrice holy, three times holy. So if we adopt that hermeneutic, we should conclude that God is three times holier than he is loving. And your whole implicit premise that people basically don't have to worry about righteousness because God is more loving, more concerned about love because it's who he is than he is concerned about holiness or justice because that's just what he possesses. God possesses justice, but he is love, aka what they're implicitly saying is you don't really have to worry about sin. You don't really have to worry about progressive holiness. You don't really have to worry about this or worry about that because God is basically more loving than he is holy. Well, that whole premise is, is horrible theology proper. Uh, but even by adopting their faulty premises, their bad hermeneutic of how they get there, all right, so let's just not even go there. 
The reality is that, that all of God's attributes, his perfections, as the Puritans argued, they're not just things that God possesses, uh, but they are who God is. God is love, that is true, but God is also holy. And as John says it in the beginning of his message, it's, it's not John's message, it's God's message. He heard it from Christ himself. He's now proclaiming it to his listeners. So it's God's message. The message doesn't begin with man, but rather the message begins with God. And what aspect of God does it begin with? Not God is love. John gets there later in 1 John, but it begins with God is light. So what does it mean for God to be light? In order to ensure that we do not miss the significance of this statement, John restates it in the negative now. So we're going to understand what it means for God to be light because John is about to tell us what it would mean for God not to be light. He's going to reissue the statement, but now in the negative sense by saying, and in God is no darkness, that is no moral imperfection at all. All right, continuing. I wrote this. Almost the entire church growth movement in America blatantly contradicts the necessity of true Christianity beginning with the holiness of God. Not only do many professing Christians in our nation object to the idea of beginning with the holiness of God, they even dare to object to Christianity beginning with God at all. Many pastors, and this is perfect depiction of Hillsong, Brian Houston, Carl Lentz, many pastors in our nation, pastors, have argued that our theology, Christian theology, should be man-centered rather than God-centered. Some church growth leaders have even gone so far as to coin the term religious consumer. Now, a religious consumer, in their worldview, would be an individual who treats Christ's church as little more than a company that exists merely to produce goods and services to meet the felt needs of men. Church growth leaders have gone to great lengths to conduct massive surveys in which they ask these religious consumers what they would like to see in their churches, instead of diligently inquiring of the scripture in order to discover what God would like to see in his churches. What's the result? Well, thousands of people have responded to these church surveys by saying, here's some of the things that people say they want. By saying um, that they want a church that is more positive and uplifting. Wow, big shocker there. These people despise churches where the pastor chooses to preach on sin and the righteous wrath of a holy God. They want practical advice on how to have healthier marriages and how to become better parents. They want seven easy steps on how to be more successful in reaching their personal destiny and true potential. Um, this should not surprise us to find that these individuals have also asked for shorter sermons. In fact, they have even demanded that pastors should not preach at them at all, but rather pastors should simply share with them. They like pastors to sit down on a stool with a little table and a coffee mug rather than actually standing behind a pulpit and preaching the word of God. They prefer pastors to use more practical illustrations and entertaining personal stories and lighthearted jokes. These religious consumers want their pastors to spend significantly less time explaining doctrine, and they adamantly insist that pastors should always avoid the use of any theological terms. These people require church services to be simpler, shorter, more positive, and most of all, focused on them. Then church marketers, that's an actual thing, church marketers have then taken all the conclusions from these surveys and these demands from pagans and completely redesigned the church, like Hillsong, to meet the felt needs of these religious consumers. What's the conclusion? What's the result? Hundreds of thousands of people in America have started attended attending church on Sunday mornings. And yet, hundreds of thousands of people in America have been programmed to despise the true gospel, even if they were actually ever to hear it. All right, almost done. Conclusion now. The church growth movement tells us to begin with man, but the apostle John tells us to begin with God. The church growth movement tells us that when we finally get to God, we should start by saying, God is love. But John tells us to start by saying, God is light. He is morally perfect, holy. 
we must come to recognize that if we do not begin with God and his holiness, the love of God will not truly capture the hearts of the people we are attempting to reach. A proper understanding of the holiness of God and by way of implication, a proper understanding of the sinfulness of man is absolutely necessary for a person to appreciate the full extent of God's grace. If we give in to the temptation to immediately skip ahead to the good news without first taking the necessary time to preach and set the theological stage with the bad news that people are sinners, then the gospel will, will inevitably fall upon deaf ears. Again, for those of you who are just tuning in, this is Am I Truly Saved? It's a book that I wrote, forwarded by Costi Hinn. Uh, it's endorsed by Justin Peters. It's a study through 1 John. It goes text by text, verse by verse, through all of 1 John's epistle, dealing primarily with the major predominant theme of 1 John, which is the assurance of salvation. And in it, I also outline why so many people who profess to be Christians don't have assurance of salvation in our nation, or, and this is even scarier, they have a false assurance of salvation. They think they're saved, but they're not. And so my point is with Hillsong, with Brian Houston, with Carl Lentz, with everybody else involved, yes, right now it is finally surfacing. And I know these things have been coming out for a while, but, but it is snowballing right? The, the, the revelation, the exposure, the ousting of top leaders like the founder, Brian Houston, and like the, the New York City, you know, pastor, Carl Lentz, that there was egregious moral failures, sexual immorality, um, adultery, uh, cover-ups for Brian Houston's father with his alleged sexual abuse of children. These kinds of things are now coming out, the egregious moral failures. But my point is that Hillsong, has been leading people to hell by the tens of thousands, if not millions, when you look at, at their internet ministry, their music, I won't call it worship, but their music um, and, and their teachings online, all these things. Uh, Hillsong has been leading tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, perhaps even millions of people to hell long before somebody cheated on their wife. Long before someone cheated on their wife. Should we take sexual sin seriously? especially among those who, who claim to be pastors. Yes, yes. But the common denominator, the root of the problem with Hillsong, the root of the problem is that they're not preaching the gospel. The root of the problem is false doctrine. And here's, here's the pattern. This is the correlation. You gotta connect the dots. We should not be surprised that those who peddle false doctrine turn out to be false themselves, right? What does Paul say to Timothy? Guard your life and doctrine closely. The two are, are <laughs> they're two peas in a pot. They are, are directly correlated. They're tied to one another. False doctrine eventually, eventually will cause you to compromise in your life, in your character. Someone who preaches false doctrine will be a false man. And someone who is a false man in their character, it will eventually, like poison, infect their doctrine. Hillsong has been peddling false doctrine since the beginning. We therefore should not be surprised that it is led by false men. But the problem is this is not exclusive to Hillsong. This is a problem with the seeker-friendly, pragmatic, um, um, anti-doctrine, anti-theology, people who have an aversion to theology. I, I just... I just love Jesus, man. I don't like theology. You know how stupid that is? I, and, and yes, stupid is the proper word. It is stupid. And let me tell you why it's stupid. All right, if I told my wife, okay? If I told my wife, I love you. I am enamored by you. I absolutely love you. And I love spending time with you. And then my wife actually opens her mouth and says, I love you too. And, and, and I, I want us to love each other even more deeply. And, and, and so therefore, I want you to grow in your knowledge of me. I, I want you not to just love spending time with me and, and love your idea of me, but I want you to love the actual me, the true me, by actually coming to know me. So let me tell you some things about me, my dreams, my aspiration, um, my, my, my personality, my fears, my concerns. Let me share knowledge 
about who I am so that you might know me more as the basis, the foundation for loving me more. And if I responded in that moment by saying, uh, shut your mouth, please. That's not what I meant. I, I really love you. I can't tell you how much I love you, Megan. That's my wife's name. I really love you. I love spending time with you. I love holding your hand. I love being intimate with you. I love doing fun things with you and going on trips with you. I love hiking with you and I love playing board games with you. I love sharing jokes with you and laughing with you, watching a movie with you, eating a meal with you, drinking a glass of wine with you. I love you. And she says, but do you have any desire to know me? And I say, no. That's exactly, exactly what it's like for someone to say, I'm not about theology, I'm just about Jesus. I love Jesus, but I don't really care about theology. Theology is the study of God. And Jesus, spoiler, is God. So in theology, all we're doing is using the scripture to understand, to study, to know God. And knowledge of God is the baseline for loving God. You might say it like this. The heart cannot love what the mind does not know. The heart cannot love, in the case of God, who the mind does not know. What is the greatest commandment? Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. That you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. Or all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Elsewhere, it says also strength. But the mind is included. Now, this is how many Christians view it, all right? You may not know this, but subconsciously, this is how many Christians view the greatest commandment. They view it as though this were um, an option, a selection, a choice. I've chosen, right? Uh, th this commandment is, is that you should love the Lord your God with, with all your heart or all your soul or all your mind instead of and, instead of and. And so people say, well, I'm a heart person, right? I'm just a heart Christian. You know, me and Jesus, we splash around in a pool of affection and love. Jesus is my boyfriend, you know, and oh my gosh, our intimacy is off the charts. I love Jesus, right? And I'm loving him with all my heart. And maybe somebody else loves him with all their mind and really loving them with, with your heart is more important than your mind. So I'm better than them, you know, and they would never say, but this is the mindset. This is the mindset. No, no, what Jesus says, and this is the greatest commandment, Kind of important, right? Might, might want to hold on to this one. The greatest commandment is not love the Lord your God in whatever way you choose. And here are some viable options for you to choose from. You could love him with your heart, or you could love him with your soul, or you could love him with your strength, your, your, your physical strength, your body, or you could love him with your mind. You go ahead and choose which one suits you. No, you love him with everything. The commandment, in summary, is, is this. What is the greatest commandment? That we should love God. And, and how should we love them? With everything we have. It's that simple, with everything we have, which includes loving him with our minds. It includes seeking to know him. And right now we have an epidemic, and we have for, for decades in America, of these mega church conglomerate brands, corporations, they're not churches, that are not about God. It's, it's man's message instead of God's message. It's not, this is what we heard from God. We're now proclaiming this message to you, God's message to you. No, it's our message. It's our opinions, our speculation about who we think God is. And, and we're not even gonna start with God, right? So it's my message rather than God's message. And the message starts with man rather than God. So let's start with you and your desires, or we should actually call them your fleshly carnal demands rather than God and his requirements, his commandments. So, so it's my message rather than God's message. The message starts with you, people, rather than starting with God. And it starts with your demands rather than God's demands. And if we ever even get to God, we will only ever get to God's love and never get to his holiness. And here's the irony. Uh, this is an aversion towards doctrine, which is which is a failure to love God himself, because that's all doctrine is, is knowing God for the purpose of loving God. So it's an aversion to theology, which is an aversion towards loving God himself. Um, but not only that, not only is it an aversion towards theology, but here's the, the tragic irony. It actually robs people of the ability to truly appreciate and understand and be amazed by God's love. By, by, by only talking about God's love and never his holiness, you rob people of the opportunity, not just to know God's holiness, but also to know his love. Also to know his love. 
Did you know that? Why? Because God's love is a particular kind of love. See, God loves the angels. Speaking of two-thirds of the angels that have never sinned against them, never fallen. These are angels that have never once, for eons and eons, committed a single sin. God loves them. But God doesn't have grace for them. Mercy for them. God loves them. You might flip it around and say, we love God. But we don't have grace for God. We love God. We don't have grace for God. Why? Because God has no need of grace. He is morally perfect. He doesn't need our grace. He's never failed. He's never faltered. He has never done anything wrong. So we love God. So my point is this. You can have love for a perfect being, but we are not perfect beings. So God doesn't merely love us. God loves us undeservedly. The love that God has for us is an undeserved love. It is unmerited favor. We might say that the love God has for us is grace. And how do we come to see the extent, the full magnitude of God's grace? Well, the way that we see the extent of God's grace is we need to see how holy is God actually? How, how holy is this God really? And how sinful am I? Because in seeing the holiness of God and in, in coming to a deeper and deeper daily, this is a process. This is really, in many ways, this is one of the ways that you could define the lifelong process of sanctification. The lifelong process of sanctification is coming into a deeper, from the scripture, from the word of God, coming in daily to a deeper and deeper understanding of the extent of God's holiness, and by way of consequence, coming under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, seeing more deeply the extent of our sinfulness, which does what? It, it in our mind, widens the chasm between a holy God and a sinful man. Now, now, ontologically, objectively, the chasm is not getting wider. You're not becoming more sinful, and God is not in process. God is not becoming more holy. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So God has always been perfectly holy. There's no room for improvement. God's not becoming more holy, and you, if you're a Christian, you're not becoming more sinful. You're actually becoming better, not worse. By the, by the work of the Holy Spirit in the process of sanctification. But what's changing is not the objective chasm or gap between a holy God and you as a sinful man. What, what is growing is not the, the objective reality, uh, but what's growing is your understanding of that reality. And so as we get closer and closer to Christ in sanctification, as we grow in our knowledge of God and his holiness, and we grow in humility and conviction by the Holy Spirit in regards to our sinfulness, the gap is not truly, not objectively widening between a holy God and our sinful selves, but our understanding of the gap is widening. And here's the final question. What bridges the gap? What bridges the gap? What is the bridge across this chasm of, of a holy God in between, this chasm in between a holy God and a sinful man. What bridges the gap? Grace, the gospel, Calvary, the cross, Jesus. So here's the tragic irony. People don't want to talk about the holiness of God because they just want to focus on the love of God. But by not understanding the extent of the holiness of God and therefore their own sinfulness, they are shrinking the love of God because the love of God for sinners is grace. It is not love for a perfect being. It is undeserved love. It's unmerited favor. It is a gracious love. And people are actually shrinking grace by not understanding that God is this holy and that I am this sinful. So by not focusing on the holiness of God, the tragic irony is that it, is it people, oh, I just want to focus on God's love. But, but the love of God, it, it becomes shallow. It becomes shallow. That's my point. So you're, you're only focusing on God's love, but ironically, only focusing on God's love robs you from understanding the true depths, the true extent, the true magnitude of God's love. So we don't preach the holiness of God to make men miserable. We love people. We love God more, but we love people. True, faithful gospel ministers love God the most, but we also love people. And we love pagan people, unbelieving people. We love sinners, just like Christ loved us in our sin and still loves us in our sin. We love people. And we know that what people most need is to understand that God is holy and that they are sinful so that they might be amazed by his grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound 
that saved a pretty good person like me, right? Isn't that how? No. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. See, people are no longer enamored by God because grace has been stripped of being amazing. And the reason why grace is no longer amazing is because we no longer refer to people as wretches. Hillsong took the amazing out of grace. And it should be no surprise that the leaders, their lives are merely now manifesting, proving, evidencing their doctrine. They didn't preach about the holiness of God and they did not preach about the sinfulness of man. It was all kept in the dark. And now all we're seeing is that those who preached this message also lived this message. And Hillsong is not the only church. Be on the lookout, be vigilant, be watchful. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. All right, last thing I'll say for those of you who are uh, maybe wondering, maybe you want to get this book, you're welcome to it. Go to rightresponseministries.com, rightresponseministries.com. That's our website, and you can get a book. Um, you can get it for a gift of any amount. So I think the minimum on there uh, for a one-time gift, you can become a monthly partner and we'll give you a book as a special thank you. But, but if you just want to get the book and you're not prepared financially to be a monthly partner, I get it. That's totally fine. Um, but you can give a one-time gift and the minimum amount is a dollar, right? So you can give a buck online at rightresponseministries.com. Um, and you'll get a digital copy of the book. And if you give, I think, a minimum of $10, then we'll, we'll mail you a physical copy of the book. Again, it's uh, forwarded by Costi Hinn, and uh, it is endorsed by Justin Peters and a few other individuals. It's called Am I Truly Saved? It's a study through 1 John dealing with the assurance of salvation. How can we come not just to believe that Jesus is the Christ, but know that Jesus is the Christ? Or, or I'm sorry, know that we believe, right? It's one thing to believe the gospel, but it's another to know that you believe right? It's one thing to be saved by God's grace. It's another to know that you are saved by God's grace, to have an assurance of salvation. And the problem with Hillsong and the seeker-sensitive, pragmatic, mega-church model in America, the problem is they, they are throwing out false assurance like candy, like candy. And, and then for those of us who are coming into right biblical doctrine, all of a sudden that false assurance is ripped away because the scripture does that, but, but oftentimes what will happen, and this is part of my own personal testimony, is the false assurance of Jesus being merely the author of sugar and spice and everything nice, that false assurance gets stripped away because the scripture won't allow for that. But then all of a sudden, sometimes what replaces it is no assurance. False assurance replaced with no assurance. Um, this book will strip away your false assurance if you have it, but not just leave you with no assurance. It will then bolster true godly assurance biblical assurance of salvation. So check it out. Um, stay on the alert. Stay watchful. Uh, love you guys. I'm grateful. Many of you have been praying uh, for our ministry. Uh, you, you email me, encourage me, uh, write comments on YouTube, all these things. You're listening to our podcast on Apple and Spotify, right? Sometimes you just don't want to watch everything on YouTube. You can uh, download our podcast, Theology Applied, uh, on Apple and Spotify, and you've been leaving comments there and reviews, five-star reviews, and writing something encouraging. That means the world to me. Uh, keep praying for me. Pray for my wife. Pray for my family. Uh, as, as God is expanding our ministry, uh, sometimes public ministries like this take a toll on, on the minister's family, on his wife and children. I'm doing a good job, I think, by God's grace to, um, to minister boldly in public, but also kind of protect my children and my wife from that public sphere. So pray that God would give me wisdom as, as, um, as a pastor of my first church, which is my home my wife and kids. I uh, pray that God would help me in that regard and pray that the Lord would keep me, that, that he would keep me. I, I don't want to run this race, um, uh, benefit others with sound doctrine, with faithful preaching, but in the end, because of my own flesh, disqualify myself. Pray that the Lord would keep me, that he would keep me bold and that he would keep me faithful. I want our ministry to grow. I do, because I love God. I want to bring him glory and I want to reach people. I want to help people. I love people. Um, but the best thing that God could do in his mercy for me, for his own glory, and for all of you is absolutely overnight destroy this ministry if, if I'm not going to be faithful. I want God to kill right response ministries if I'm not going to be courageous and if I'm not going to be faithful. So pray that I would remain faithful and pray that if I'm not, that God would remove this lampstand. 
that God would remove this platform so that I don't do what Brian Houston and Carl Lentz have done for years, namely, lie to people and lead them to hell. All right, love you guys. Thanks so much. Talk to you later. I don't know how to turn this off. You guys are still watching. <laughs> I'm not very technical. I think I got it now. All right, bye.